Hi, and welcome to the next lecture in aerodynamics. Last time, we discussed path lines, streak lines, and streamlines, how they differ, how they're the same for steady flow, and how they can be used for flow visualization. We also constructed the stream function, an aerodynamic tool for analyzing streamlines using the velocity field. Today, we're going to start to introduce tools that we will use for rotational flows. These include concepts like vorticity, or the spinning component of the fluid element, and the circulation, which is the total vorticity enclosed around a loop. The circulation specifically is critical in understanding and calculating lift later on in our studies. And once we learn all about rotation, we're going to take it away and see what happens if we assume our flow is irrotational, leading us to the velocity potential. Okay, let's jump in. Up to this point, we have really only considered the flow's translation through a three-dimensional space, or how a blob of fluid moves through x, y, and z. But that blob can get from A to B following the same path while either spinning or not spinning. So we introduce the concept of rotational and irrotational flow. Whether the flow is rotational or irrotational has huge implications on your analysis strategy and the complexity of your problem in aerodynamics. To introduce the concept, let's consider a non-fluids example. Let's say you decide against your better judgment that you'd like to go to the local fair. And there are only two rides you want to go on, the Ferris wheel and the Gravitron. These two rides introduce the concept of rotationality quite nicely. But instead of a fluid blob, we're going to consider your location as a person and orientation on each ride. First up is the Ferris wheel. The Ferris wheel is a big vertically oriented circle that has carts that you ride in. It doesn't go particularly fast, but it gives you a great view. So you hop on, go around a few times in that big circle, and then you get off. And you might think to yourself, well, I rotated around the circle, so if I were to consider myself a fluid element and that was a flow, it was rotational. And you'd be wrong. You see, while you were rotating around, your cart kept you from changing your orientation. You faced the same way throughout the entire ride. So in a fluid sense, your flow experience was irrotational. Next, you find yourself at the Gravitron, a noticeably more violent and gut-wrenching ride. On this ride, you get into a giant circle that is lying flat or horizontal, and you get to an outer wall and lean against it. As the ride spins, the centripetal force pulls you against the wall, your skin and organs feel funny for a while, then it stops and you wobble off. In this case, you went in a circle, similarly to the Ferris wheel, but this time you also changed which direction you were facing because you always face the center of the circle. This means that you, the fluid element, were rotating in your flow, and the flow was considered rotational. For an actual fluid, it's quite similar. Consider flow along a streamline, with our fluid element represented by the box moving along that streamline. In this first case, the box is not changing orientation, and thus the flow is considered irrotational. Now consider a second case with the same streamline, but the box is clearly rotating. The fluid element is changing orientation and is considered rotational. This specific type of rotation would be considered solid body rotation because the fluid element is rotating without distorting, as if it were a solid box. However, fluids get much more complicated than solids because they can distort when under a shear stress. Consider a third case with the same streamline. Now, as the fluid element, our box moves along the streamline, and it deforms in an odd way. Here, it isn't so clear if the orientation of the box is changing, because we typically think of it in terms of solid motion instead of our fluid motion. But, if we take a look at the change in angles of the sides, we can get a better idea. In this case, the bottom and top sides have rotated counterclockwise, so it has a positive delta theta. The left and right sides rotated clockwise by an equal amount, 
so the angle is negative delta theta. The net change in the angle of the sides is zero, which means that it has a zero net angular velocity. This means the flow remains irrotational, despite the distortion. And now let's consider our last case, the same streamline again with a fluid element traveling along it, but under a different type of distortion. Now, the bottom and top sides of our element have not changed orientation, but the left and right sides have rotated counterclockwise, so they have a positive delta theta. Summing up all the sides, we would find a non-zero net change in the side angles, which means we have a non-zero angular velocity, and therefore a rotational flow. So, fluids undergo rotation in the traditional sense, like a solid body would rotate, and in non-traditional ways unique to deformable fluids, which is called distortion. Above, we mentioned the angular velocity as representing the rotation, but the true measure of rotation in a fluid is something called the vorticity. Let's define this vorticity with a bit more mathematical rigor. Consider a fluid element represented by a rectangle on a 2D xy plane. At time equals t, it is a perfect rectangle with width dx and height dy, and corners are marked a, b, c, and d. What we're going to do is look at how this rectangle deforms, and specifically the location of the corners as it deforms. The velocity at a is our base point, so we give it the vertical component v and horizontal velocity component u. Now, our fluid element might be in the presence of a velocity gradient in space, so the velocity of the other corners isn't the same as the velocity of a. The horizontal velocity of the top left corner, for example, is the base velocity plus the velocity gradient multiplied with the distance from the base point. Also, the vertical velocity at point C is just the vertical velocity of A with the addition of the change in velocity due to the gradient in X. Now, let's let some time go by. So time equals T plus delta T, and look at how our rectangle changed shape. Due to the velocity gradients, it's all distorted, pushing the corners at all different locations and velocities. And this brings up an important point. You need velocity gradients to deform or rotate your fluid element. Otherwise, the corners all go the same velocity and it stays a nice rectangle. So, velocity gradients lead to rotational flow. But we still have our four corners, A, B, C, and D. The sides have rotated a certain amount relative to the original orientation, which we'll call delta theta 1 and delta theta 2. Our goal is to calculate the angular velocity, so we need to figure out these theta values. To do this, we need to first figure out how far points B and C have moved from their original axis. Off to the right, let's think it out. We know that the y distance that point A moves in the time delta t is just the velocity at A times the amount of time that passed. And similarly, C moves the velocity at point C from our original diagram, which was V plus dV dx times dx, all multiplied by delta t. The distance we're interested in is how far in the y direction point C has moved relative to point A. That means we take the difference between the distance C moved and the distance A moved which gives us the travel due to the velocity gradient alone. So, we mark that height on our diagram, dv dx times dx times delta t. Similarly, point b has moved in the x direction relative to point a by a distance of du dy times dy times delta t. Okay, now we can do some trigonometry to get the angles th delta theta 1 and delta theta 2. Starting with the bottom side, set up our triangle with vertical distance defined by the velocity gradient, horizontal distance is just dx, and the angle delta theta 2. So Katoa tells us that the tangent of delta theta 2 
is equal to the opposite side divided by the adjacent side, which works out to be dv dx times delta t. Now, eventually we're going to assume that we're looking at tiny changes in time so we can do differentials, and that means we can also assume the angle of deformation is pretty small. And if the angle of deformation is small, then tan delta theta 2 is approximately just delta theta 2, dropping the tangent. So, we get a relation for delta theta 2. Let's take a second and do it out for the left side. And now, we have relations for both angles. But we're eventually looking for the rate of deformation, not just the angle. So we'll want to move our delta t's over to the left side. Assuming changes are small, we can turn our deltas into differentials, and we have the time derivative of the angles. By definition, this is the angular velocity of our fluid element, and it is the average of angular velocities of our two sides. So, we define omega z, where omega means angular velocity, and z refers to the spinning direction. In other words, we're rotating on the xy plane, spinning about the z axis. That is equal to one half of the sum of the two angular velocities, which we can then define in terms of the velocity gradients. And it's important to realize that in three dimensions there are three separate components of angular velocity, omega x, omega y, and omega z. The whole angular velocity vector can be written out as a function of the velocity gradients in the i, j, and k directions. And finally, we define the vorticity as being double the angular velocity, so we get that psi is twice omega. I find it useful to write out the three components separately as xi x, xi y, and xi z. Note, if flow was 2D, xi z is what we would care about. Here it's important to note that this is typically shortened mathematically as being del cross v, or the curl of the velocity field. So, if the vorticity vector is not zero everywhere, your flow is considered rotational. If it is zero everywhere, it is irrotational. You might be wondering when you can assume flow is irrotational, and for aerodynamics you can assume it a surprising amount. Many flows in aerodynamics are considered irrotational, or at least mostly irrotational. Take for instance flow over an airfoil. Most of it is irrotational, and irrotational analysis can do a good job of getting you the forces on that airfoil. However, very close to the surface we have a boundary layer, which means we have strong velocity gradients due to the surface condition. And from our diagram of the deforming element, gradients can lead to rotation. So, it's safe to assume that outside of the boundary layer, away from surfaces, things are mainly irrotational. But inside the boundary layer near surfaces, the flow is likely rotational. Okay. Now we should step aside for a second and quickly consider a tool we'll make use of a lot later on, called circulation. This tool relates things like vorticity to things like aerodynamic lift. Consider a flow represented by a set of streamlines. Imagine if we enclose some fluid inside a loop C, and we take look at the flow that follows that loop around the curve. The loop curve coordinate is s, as we've done in the past, and each loop segment, ds, is a vector and has an associated velocity vector with it, v. The circulation, roughly speaking, represents the total flow around the loop path. So, if we want the amount of flow around the loop, we first take the dot product of the two vectors, ds and v, which accounts for the angle between them and then add up all the segments around the loop with an integral closed around c. This is the definition of the circulation, gamma, based on the velocity field. However, we can be clever with mathematics and use something called the Stokes theorem. This states that if we have a vector quantity a 
dot product around some curve ds in a closed integral, we can represent that by doing a surface integral of the curl of a over the surface big S. Here, little s is the coordinate around the outer loop, and big S is the surface of the entire closed amount. Now, if we use that above, we notice that we can define the circulation gamma as the curl of the velocity. And this is important because, as we've just learned, the curl of the velocity is the vorticity. So essentially, the circulation around an enclosed area is the amount of vorticity added up inside that area. Now, we won't go into details here. We're just building a tool. We'll see circulation a lot later on in our studies. But we will find it pretty important, mostly because circulation is a proper way to estimate lift over a wing. If we enclose the flow over a wing inside some looped area, the circulation of that area can eventually get us to the lift force. Okay, now that we've talked about rotational flows, where vorticity is non-zero and we have circulation, we can start to think about what would happen if our flow was irrotational, like in a lot of cases for aerodynamics. What we're able to do is make a function called the velocity potential, which necessarily exists for irrotational flow. The discussion here will be very similar to the stream function because the creation is similar. Instead of deriving the velocity potential, we sort of build it. So what we're going to do is start with our condition for irrotational flow, and that the curl of velocity is zero, or that there is no vorticity. A clever mathematician might notice that, hey, we have a vector identity that says the curl of a gradient of a scalar in this case the gradient of the scalar is del phi, must also be zero. So we have a math identity that looks similar to our irrotational condition. Naturally, you can state that the velocity field must be equal to the gradient of scalar phi for an irrotational flow. The physical intuition is lost a bit here. We are more so combining a condition of our flow with a math identity. If we break this up into the x, y, and z components, we notice that the velocity potential can define all three velocity components by just taking the derivative of the potential in the direction of the velocity. This is useful for theoretical analysis because we can take three equations, one for each velocity, and combine them into a single equation based on this velocity potential. For completeness, let's also write them out for cylindrical coordinates. Now, you may notice some similarities between the velocity potential, a scalar, and the stream function, also a scalar. First, we note that the velocity potential can work for three-dimensional flows, where the stream function requires two-dimensional flow, or at least axisymmetric flow. However, the velocity potential requires the assumption of irrotational flow where we can use the stream function in flow with our vorticity. And last, both functions get you the velocity field by taking some spatial gradients, where you take gradients in line with the velocity for phi, and you take gradients perpendicular to the velocity direction with psi. Let's end on a short practical note. Generally, a lot of flows are considered irrotational in aerodynamics, and we'll make use of that later on. However, there will be cases where the irrotational assumption gets you close to an answer, but not quite far enough. Take an airfoil as an example. Away from the surface, we say flow is irrotational, but near the surface we can't say that. What you might find yourself doing is an irrotational analysis at the first step, like using the velocity potential. However, near the boundary, you need to do something a bit more complicated and include the entire equations, making sure to include the viscosity. And it's also important to keep in mind that, while inviscid assumptions and irrotational assumptions are separate, if you're making the assumption that flow is irrotational, you're also generally assuming the flow is inviscid. This is because, generally speaking, 
As we saw today, you need velocity gradients to make the fluid element rotate. Similarly, as we saw in our conservation equation derivations, you need velocity gradients to create a viscous force. Therefore, neglecting rotation and viscosity can go hand in hand. And that's it. Let's review. Today, we introduced the concept of rotation to our toolbox. We started by using a simple non-fluids example to introduce the concept of an irrotational and rotational flow. Then, we extended it to fluids where the element was allowed to both rotate like a solid body and distort or deform. We defined vorticity, which represents the angular velocity or the rotation of the fluid. One useful tool that uses vorticity is the circulation, which has implications later on in our studies about calculating lift. And lastly, like the stream function, we used some mathematical identities and flow conditions to create the velocity potential, a scalar function defined by the velocity field. I hope you enjoyed the video and thanks for watching.